You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to Faith and Other Oddities, the show where Emily and I read the Bible, talk about it, and uh, try to make sense of what we're doing. (laughs) What is that, making sense of what we're doing? That sounds like entirely too much responsibility for us. (laughs) I mean, <laughs> well, there's one there there is one thing we try to be really responsible about. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Now, it, it honestly, it, it scares me to death to think that I'm going to get something like heinously wrong. I mean, there's there's going to be small mistakes along the way. I mean, that's just a given. It's me. But like something just fundamentally flawed being put out there just ah, uh, no, please. <laughs> Hopefully I can avoid that. Um oh. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm with you, and and fortunately, um, I know that, that you know. I think I think if it's not intentional, I think God kind of gives you a little grace, right? I hope um, so. But if there is like just flagrant disregard uh, for what He is teaching, then then that's when you kind of get in the uh, yeah the troubled areas. Well, and I I think that's one of the things that going through a book kind of helps keep you honest because it's harder to pull a passage out of context and say, oh, here's what it means. Um, you know, you can't really twist it quite as easily if you're following the flow. And so that's that's one of the things that I, I really enjoy about, you know, starting in, at the beginning of a book and working our way through. And I think more people need to do that instead of studying simply systematics. And, you know, there's a place and a time and a purpose for systematics, but there there needs to be an understanding of the narratives. There needs to be an understanding of historical and cultural context. Uh, those are the sorts of things that you only get whenever you do take the time to work through verse by verse and not just pull the verses that fit your agenda. And so, uh, you know, not to offend any of our systematic friends and neighbors, but <laughs> just, uh, you know, if you aren't taking time to do total book studies, whole book studies, then um, maybe you need to reconsider that. So just a thought. And Yeah, well, I, I really don't think anyone who's listening to our program uh, is in much danger of not doing book studies. This is I mean, true. You're, we're kind of, <laughs> if you're listening, you're kind of doing one. Right, right. Uh, and it, it is uh, a book study full of rabbit trails. Now, I, I also, also, blah, 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 blah try this again um i had somebody ask me this week because i i made the comment last week that i was doing um maybe even made it a couple of times that because my study time kind of gets broken up in these little blocks that it tends to lead me down different rabbit trails and uh, so one of my friends asked me why that happened and so i thought i'd like clarify if anybody else had the question Basically, what happens is I'll be looking at a verse or I'll be looking at a word or a phrase or idea, and I'll be in the middle of it. And when I have to walk away, I make like this mental note that I need to return to that particular thing. And who knows how long it's going to be before I get back. So, you know, if I've got four hours that I left, you know, the desk when the last thought in my head being I need to look up the word Zabul. I've got that word pinging around in my head for four hours, coming up with all the different questions that I could ask about that particular thought and idea. And by the time I get back, I I have to trace down, chase down all of those little um, side quests that this one little word has, has, you know, kind of presented to me. And if I don't have like those blocks of times, I think like Zabul is a real example, was an overnight thing. So I actually spent like 12 to 16 hours thinking about the possible um, the possible thoughts and th- reasons for this word was used and what it could convey and all of that for that entire time period because it's like running on a loop in the background of my brain. So that's the reason why these little blocks of time end up with things being far more scattered and less focused because now that it's become an obsessive thought, I have to chase down 
all of the information. So that's how that happens. <laughs> and bless you. It's allergy season again. So yeah, uh, sorry about that. But um, last week, uh, we kind of wrapped up. I was talking about um, why I cho choose to use the word Shekinah, even though it's not found in uh, the scripture itself. That, uh, that is something we only find later in the Targums and, and other rabbinic texts. Uh, so that, that being said, you know, it is a nice little shorthand. It, it does help us um, kind of have a way to refer to this idea without having to speak with all these qualifiers. They're, they're kind of included in the text. And it was a word that was already in popular usage by the time the New Testament was written. So I don't think that there should be any kind of issue with using something that the rabbis used. I, I, I think that's kind of an arbitrary dividing line. It's because there's this really weird fear I found with some Christians is, oh, we're, we're getting too rabbinic. Uh, no, uh, no, we're not. We're not practicing rabbinic Judaism. We're just looking at the ideas that these guys have talked about and discussed because they do study the text. And so if we're studying the text, they're studying the text. Sometimes these ideas are going to converge and that's okay. And then imagine drawing the same conclusion by studying the same text. Right. Right. And, you know, and there's going to be places where there's division and there's, we're going to come to different conclusions. And that's fine, too. We can acknowledge that. But, you know, if they've already invented the wheel, I don't need to do it again. So, um, you know, I, and I do respect the amount of time and thought they put into um, the study of Scripture. So, um, but that being said, Shekinah is not part of this verse in 1 Kings chapter 8, where the cloud descends and the priest can no longer serve. Um, so I want to look at what is in the verse. And the verse in there, uh, the words that we have in this verse is for, for cloud is Anon. Uh, it's used 87 times in the scripture, and it's, almost it's used almost exclusively in relationship to God. The first time we encounter it, um, it's God speaking to Noah about the rainbow, and that's in Genesis. Um, oh, I didn't write the reference down, but it's in Genesis where God says to Noah that he's going to set a bow in the clouds. So very easy verse to find. The next time we find the verse, uh, the word is in Exodus. And this is when God uh, leads the nation by a pillar of the cloud. And all further uses within the Torah are going to reference this event. And as a matter of fact, when we get into the Psalms, almost all the uses, well, all the uses in the Psalm of this particular word refer back to Exodus or they are describing God coming on the clouds, riding the clouds. So there's that idea. Hosea, Joel, Nahum, Zephaniah all talk about the clouds in reference to uh, God's coming um, judgment. There's only one kind of deviation, and it's kind of, I'm splitting hairs here, but let's be accurate, is uh, in the book of Job, we find it used, but it's used in, creation, in praise of the creator. So it's not really that difference. It's still in reference to, to God and God's actions and manifestation of his power. And since overwhelmingly this cloud is this word for cloud, because there's other words for clouds, uh, since this particular word is used in relationship with God, and it was talking about either his protection or his provision or his wrath and his judgment, um, it, it becomes very focused on this manifestation of who God is. And matter of fact, this leads to some really interesting um, questions, such as, is the cloud God? Is the cloud a created aspect or representation of God? Is this a symbol of his presence, or is this actually God being presence? Uh, if, if you've studied any early Christian theology, you're going to know these are questions that you should already be familiar with, that these are questions you've heard in a different context. And, uh, you know, these questions lead to more questions. Should the cloud and Shekinah be worshipped? Is it okay to worship the cloud? Or is that a form of idolatry because you aren't worshiping God himself? And so how do you grapple with that? If God's being manifest so powerfully in this one place, in this one certain location, what does this mean for his presence throughout the rest of the world? 
And if God elected to be manifest in this place, is he gone in the rest of creation? Uh, these are all questions that the, that the Jewish people had to wrestle with. Now, the cloud, some of the things we do know about it are that it has a physical impact. It has a physical effect on the people who come in contact with it. Um, Moses, for instance, when he comes down from Sinai, from the cloud, there's a cloud covering Sinai. It changes his appearance so much that he has to wear a veil in order for the other people to be able to look at him. Uh, it overwhelms these guys who are trying to serve in the temple. The disciples are terrified on the Mount of Transfiguration whenever the bright cloud overshadowed them. That's Matthew 17, 5. And it says Jesus is transfigured and before them, his face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as light. In Luke 9, 34, describing the same event, they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And so the cloud seems to be some kind of an extension or emanation of God, by, while not fully, um, while not being a full manifestation or appearance of God himself. And this is important because a physical manifestation of God in Second Temple um, Judaism, that's, that's problematic. Because their idea of God is that he's so far removed, he's so holy, and we talked about some of this last week. You can't even talk about who God is. You can only talk about who God isn't because your ideas of what it is to be good, what it is to be wise, what it is to be loving or kind, these are so far removed from the totality and the reality of what that is whenever it's God's love, God's wisdom, God's kindness, that your words don't even begin to line up with the truth of who God is. And so this sparked these huge debates within the, the rabbin, rabbinic, rabbinic schools. Um, and so they were left to, you know, how do you grapple with this puzzle? And so the puzzle really is how can God be so near while still being transcendent? How can God be a part of this reality while still maintaining his holiness? And that's why the word Shekinah was adopted because it allowed to have this kind of shorthand that addressed this thing where God can be near, he can be present, but he can still be transcendent and he can be holy. And um, the, the need for and the usage of this, of this term demonstrates how all these arguments, all these discussions that were going on in the rabbinic schools, it, you know, they are very old discussions that help us understand and frame the discussions that are going to happen when Jesus, God embodied, walks the earth. Because now all these questions that have been asked of the Shekinah and all of these definitions and ways to understand God's manifestation through this cloud, they're going to be reframed in the idea of who is Jesus? Can Jesus be God that close, that near, that tangible, and still be transcendent God? And what I love about this is it, it, it really teaches us that these conversations were not new conversations. That the that the Judaism had already been prepared to have these kinds of discussions way before Jesus walked the earth. God didn't blindside them with a new concept or a new revelation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, how many times did you hear in Sunday school that, you know, God was so distant and the you know the people of of Israel didn't have any uh, concept of God being personal? Didn't you know? Right. Didn't think of him in that way. And when, and you know, the Jesus came along and he said that God was our father and this is so foreign to them that God could be, a, and it, I'm like, no, not really. Because if you look at the argument, the discussion, I can't remember where the passage is, um, but you know, where Jesus references Psalm 82 uh, to defend himself from saying so that John. he and the father are one, you know, it, it's like, okay, guys, um, if Jesus says the Father and I are one, but there's no concept of this, why are they offended? Right, right. Because the, you know it, it's just proof that there is a concept of God as Father in in Judaism mm -hmm. because they understood what Jesus was saying, and it's it's frustrating to me that that so much of the popular you know popular Christian theology is that Jesus just showed up and started inventing terms. Well, and, and it's, it's frustrating. Th th there's also this idea that um, the Second Temple Jewish um, people in general were just stupid. 
I mean, that's really what it boils down to is that they were ignorant of what the Bible had taught, that they, they had no ability to understand. And uh, that, that kind of mindset actually is something that followed through until the, the Middle Ages uh, in Europe. And this is, you know, the Jews didn't deserve to be able to study the Bible because they couldn't properly interpret it. Um, it it's this idea of, you know, just denigrating an entire race because, you know, they didn't get it right. And, and I, I, yeah, they missed Jesus. I, we can't deny that. But at the same time, these guys weren't stupid. Well, uh, I mean, you know? a lot of them missed Jesus. And also, that was intentional mm -hmm. uh, to a degree. Right. And, I mean, because we talk about, you know, there was kind of this temporary Blind. blindness on a lot of people to not recognize him until after the resurrection so that Jesus could accomplish his purpose. Well, I mean, so you can't really just go, oh, they were stupid. I mean, that's just, it, well, and they're over that's a terrible argument. Well, and, and, I, and I was listening to a thing the other day, and I, cause, and I, wish I, I wish I had, I know it's somewhere in Jesus the Jewish theologian, but we're, I was listening to something the other day where they were talking about just the church in general and how uh, the church needs to be revamped because it's become evil. And, you know, the, uh, you know, and I don't remember, it was some, I can't remember which podcast it was, but <laughs> what, they were, what they were saying, I, I listen on, on an average day, I listen to about six different right, podcasts. Right. Um, so um, that's why I always get them mixed up. It's not that I have a terrible memory. It, it, there's that too, <laughs> but it's the fact that I listen to a whole lot of different stuff. But anyway, but they were saying when Jesus came, he, he turned over the system that he, he condemned the Pharisaical system. And it's like, he didn't really condemn the system as a whole. He condemned the hypocritical Pharisees and even said, do as they say, mm -hmm. not as they mm -hmm. do. So, you know, you can't make that blanket statement right. that, that Jesus was just tore down the whole system of Judaism. I mean, that's, that's an ignorant statement. It shows me that you haven't studied Second Temple Judaism at all. Or that Jesus somehow hated the Old Testament law. And yeah, th that's, that's not what was going on here. And the other thing, too, we forget. All of Jesus' original followers were Jews. It, it wasn't like, you know, he attracted crowds of Gentiles around him. It was the Jewish people. I mean, it, it, we can't condemn all. Judaism or condemn all Jews just because we, it, it feels, you know, it feels good. We can say we're superior. We, we look, we Christians, we got it. We understood it. Well, the reason why we get and understand what we, we get and understand is because of how we've been raised and what we've been taught. Uh, so we need to be very careful about feeling any kind of smugness. And yeah, Paul mentions that. <laughs> It's crazy how Paul talks about so many things that we're still dealing with within the church today, um, you know, but, but that's the thing. I mean, what we're finding and what I, I enjoy seeing as we're studying through these, these different ideas in the books is there's a continuity, there's a consistency within human spirituality that, that has never changed. And God has always addressed it in ways that, I mean, Appropriate seems kind of almost too dismissive, but he, he does it in the, the most correct and most um, effective manner possible. And, you know, uh, in the story of the Shekinah, whenever they're talking about, you know, is, is this a, a created part of God? Is this God himself? They're, the discussions are so rich and they're so deep. And, uh, they came to some really good conclusions that set them up to see who Jesus really was. Uh, I referenced this book last week. Uh, again, this is Ephraim Erbach, uh, The Sages. I, I really, I, I've just broken the back on this book and I, I love it. But um, here's what he has to say about the conclusions about the Shekinah as, um, as presented in the Jewish uh, discussions, the rabbinic discussions. It says the concept of the Shekinah as separate, as a separate, created being is not to be found in any rabbinic source. He, referencing God, and his Shekinah are one and the same. The concept of the Shekinah does not aim to solve the questions of God's quiddity, his essence or nature, but to give expression to his presence in the world and his nearness to man without at the same time destroying the sense of distance. 
And, you know, this is a question that we as Christians have grappled with, with since the beginning of Christianity. We, we've tried to understand how in the world does God draw so near, immerse himself in our humanity at such a fundamental level and still remain holy, transcendent creator God? That's a massive issue. Massive. And libraries of books have been written on this. Gallons of ink have been spilled. And so I, I, I love the fact that this is not just a new question that all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute, what are, how do we address this, this discussion? What terms do we use to apply to uh, these concepts so we can even have the debate? That was already in place. These were not new things that they had to formulate a new language in order to be able to discuss. It, it's right there. It was in the middle of, the, of their discussions. And so much so that I think we see evidence that even the most basic Jewish believer at this time understood this. Because notice how, how Peter describes his experience at the Mount of Transfiguration. This is in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. He says, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son who, in whom I, with him I am well pleased. Verse 18, we ourselves heard the voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So he, he's already talking about what's going on. He, he's reframing this argument and he's bringing Jesus right into the middle of it. Uh, this word majestic here, and if you notice, if you read the ESV, majestic glory is in all caps. That's a Greek word that only appears one time in the New Testament. And we only find it uh, in the Septuagint in uh, second and third Maccabees. And it's always used to describe God, uh, his majestic name or his majestic presence. So Peter is using the language of the day to refer to God's cloud-like manifestation and of self to humanity. He's saying this was God showing honor to Christ in this moment. And he's discussing the events, the, uh, the presence of the Shekinah. Even though he doesn't use that word, he's using words that apply. And so he's saying, hey, this is still part of this greater discussion. And so we also see this, this equation working both ways. So God's cloud or Shekinah, uh, either one, the appearance in the temple, uh, it happens at Jesus' uh, baptism. Uh, we know that happens at transfiguration. Uh, they all convey one thing, God's approval. And by the way, that verse there, I know I said it happened at the Mount of Transfiguration, and some people, people are going to be like, no, that's what God said at Jesus' baptism. It's said in both settings, the transfiguration and the baptism, this is my son in whom I well please. Now, we should not forget that Solomon here in Second King and First Kings, he is making a statement based on the prophecy that we saw in Second Samuel seven fourteen, where he becomes God's son. And so, um, the other really cool thing about what Peter's talking about is that when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter wanted to make skeneos. Skeneos, if you remember last, I think I've talked about this last week. That's the, the do what? The shelters or the, huts the tabernacle. Or yeah, it's the same word that the Septuagint uses for the tabernacle. And so, and he was, you know, Peter was rebuked at the um, Mount of Transfiguration because God's no longer going to dwell just in a tabernacle or just in a, a temple. He's going to well among um, those of us who, who love and follow him. So verse 12, uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 is where we are. Then Solomon said, The Lord said he would dwell in thick darkness. I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Okay, so this is where I kind of really geeked out because this, <laughs> this is such a weird thing, a, a verse for me. When I was reading it, you know, what is Solomon saying here? The Lord has said he would dwell. Another translation said he intended to dwell or he meant to dwell. And then Solomon says, but then I've built you this exalted house. And it's, it's, here's something better than what you intended, what, than what God intended for himself. I, th it's just a really weird verse. Because what is, I mean, 
did Solomon's pride get the best of him? What's he saying here? And so uh, I spent a lot of time picking this apart. So first of all, I went back to our good friend Alter, Robert Alter, which, uh, as y'all know, I'm a fan of his Hebrew translation of the Bible. Um, and I read his commentary, and he points out that this is a triadic line of poetry. And he notes that the last line is um, found in the Song of the Sea. And so that a place for you to dwell forever. So that's Exodus 15, 7, 17. However, you're probably not going to see that if you're reading the ESV. This is, I don't know why they do this. They change stuff and you can't see the connections. But I want to read you how Alter has it translated. We're going to start with 1 Kings 8, uh, 12. And it says, then Solomon said, the Lord meant to abide in thick fog. I indeed built for built you a lofty house, a firm place for your dwelling forever. So Exodus fifteen seventeen, you will bring them, you'll plant them, and you will mount them on your, on the mount of your estate, a firm place for your dwelling. You, you rot, Lord. Okay, can't read this morning. Uh, but a firm place for your dwelling. Both of the times we have that repeated in each one, a firm place for your dwelling. And so Alter makes this comment on the verse in Exodus. He says the Hebrew noun, makon, which is place, and the related verse, konen, which is established or wrought, are regularly associated in biblical idiom with the solid establishment of a throne or dynasty. Since a mountain is also referred to here as it is sanctum or a mikdash, is mentioned at the end of the verse is highly likely that the poet has in mind what the poet has in mind is the temple on Mount Zion, which is imagined as God's earthly throne or dwelling place. So very appropriate that Solomon would decide, hey, I need to quote this here. He's reminding the read the readers and the audience that this was always God's intended purpose from the time God brought Israel out of Egypt. I mean, it was like right there. This is when the Red Sea crashes down on Pharaoh. This is the song of celebration that's being sung at that moment. And so this is not like God got to Canaan and went, you know, I think it'd be nice to have a place to live. You know, this was always his purpose. And so when, eh, <laughs> yeah, a little place with a view looking over the city. Uh, but. If you look at the, the Song of the Sea as the lens through which to view uh, both Solomon being established as king and the building of the temple, which the two are kind of hand in hand because building a temple is the work of kings and only a king gets to build a temple. So it kind of helps focus us in because if you go back and you read through the Song of the Sea, which I mean, it's a really great song and it's got so much in it. Um, at some point we probably should just like dive into it, but not today. I just wanted to look at some main points. God's recounting, or it's recounting God's victory. This is Moses. Moses is recounting God's victory over Pharaoh at the Red Sea. I mean, he's like, you, you know, just jubilant. But then it also anticipates the fear that this event is going to strike into, quote, the inhabitants of Philistia, the chiefs of Edom, the leaders of Moab, all the inhabitants of Canaan. The, the language is blatantly violent. Uh, Pharaoh is thrown or cast into the sea. His enemies are shattered. Uh, God consumes them like stubble. God is described as a man of war, uh, glorious in his power. And then Moses, in the middle of this, he asks this very troublesome question where he says, uh, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, you majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds? doing wonders, you stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. Um, so basically what the Song of the Sea is saying is this, this conflict, this battle that's raging, isn't between God and humanity. This battle is between God and the gods who seduced humanity, those other Elohim. And Putting that into context with Solomon building this temple and Solomon being established on the throne, basically, this is saying that this is the declaration God has won. God has triumphed over these other gods who attempted to take the promised land from God's people. You know, Israel is his portion, Jacob is his inheritance. He's reclaiming what was his. And here's the symbol of it 
He's got his king on the throne, not some other king that represents some other god. And he has his temple built on Mount Zion, the, the holy place that's gone you know, way back in history has been in service to Yahweh himself. Uh, you know, we go back to Melchizedek. Um, so this isn't a celebration of a building being completed. This isn't, you know, oh, yay, we got the new wing built on the church. This is a celebration of God's triumph over his enemies. And that's really cool because I think we miss that if we aren't looking at the process that brought us here and how we got there. So when God, you know, shows... Yeah, yeah I mean, well, and there, there's kind of that echo of, uh, if, if you're looking at the creation as a temple account, mm -hmm. then on the seventh day, God rested. And we think of rest, you know, and, and they, they cover this on... Uh, TJ and, and Chris cover this on Answers to Giant Questions. Um, that one I remember. Um, but they, um, uh, they talk about how resting isn't so much just like, oh, I'm going to take a day off. Resting is saying that your rule is, that his, God's rule was complete there. It's whole. It, yeah, it was the fullness. And so if you take this idea of, of the temple, it kind of echoes creation as you're saying, like, it's the place is saying it represents conquering the enemies that his, that he's completely mm -hmm. in control of the land. Well, when do you um, go home? When do you sit on your throne? I mean, the, the kings in those days, they would go out into battle with their warriors. You didn't get to go sit in your castle on your, you know, on your throne until your enemies were defeated. And this is the reason why David had so much problems when he stayed at home when he should have been on the battlefield. He was not where he belonged. And so th this moment with the, the temple being dedicated, this is God ascending to or descending to his earthly throne. And so the Solomon, the, the Solomon's declaration here is a reminder uh, of how this was what was supposed to happen. And, and I think we sometimes forget that this is, all of history is playing out according to God's decrees and commands. And I'm not talking about that in a deterministic way. God's just saying, I'm going to win. You can choose to be on my side or not. Um, then, so... The word Solomon uses in his opening address, you know, that God is going to dwell in this dark cloud or thick cloud. Uh, this is different than the verse, uh, the word used in um, verse 11, where the cloud drives the priest out. Uh, in verse 11, the word's Anon, and in verse 12, the word is Arafel. Uh, we first encounter the word Arafel when uh, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments and going up to Sinai. It's Exodus 20, 21. And it says the people stood far off while Moses knew, drew, drew near the thick darkness is what the ASV has. It's the word Arafel there for thick darkness, where God was. Alter again, he's consistent. We love him for this. He, he, Moses drew into the thick cloud, not the darkness. And Now, the reason why ESV makes the shift, and I, I think I do need to acknowledge there is a reason for this, is because we have this story recounted twice, once in Deuteronomy 4 and then again in Deuteronomy 5. Because evidently it's important we get this. Anytime the Bible repeats a story, you're supposed to understand that it's important. This is not a book that wastes a lot of words. And so in Deuteronomy 4.11, it reads, And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire at the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, or Koshak, a cloud, Anon, and gloom, Arafel. So in Deuteronomy 4, we have the words, the two words for cloud, uh, Anon, and Arafel in parallel with darkness. And so we have first a cloud with no description about its quality or nature. And then we have darkness, Kushak. And then we have darkness and this idea of a cloud combined to give us a fuller description that this Arafel cloud it is a dark, thick cloud. Uh, the same descriptions re repeated in Deuteronomy 5.22. Then in 2 Samuel, and this is a Davidic psalm that we talked about this, and I totally miss this. This is another reason why I like doing these, these studies like this, because, yeah, we studied 2 Samuel 22 as we went through 2 Samuel, but now we're going to see how it helps us understand what Solomon's thinking. How do we get inside Solomon's head? Well, we look at the man who influenced Solomon, his dad. And so that helps us understand stuff. So in 2 Samuel 22, it says, He bowed the heavens and came down thick, 
darkness, Arafel, under his feet, rode on a cherubim of flu, and he was seen on the wings of the wind. He made darkness, Keshek, around, uh, around him, his canopy, thick clouds, anon, gathering a gathering of water. Out of the brightness before him, coals of fire flamed forth. So David, he's writing the psalm. He's using this poetic parallelism where one line explains the next line. So we get a fuller understanding of what's going on and where in one line of the stanza explains the, you know, that the Arafel is under his feet as thick darkness and the darkness, Koshek, is made into a canopy and the canopy's thick clouds, it's anon, which is a gathering of water. Now, um, it's interesting to me that the ESV drops the final phrase here out of this poem and I think it, it helps. Uh, Alter retrain, retains it in his translation, and this is f found in the Septuagint. So it's in the Septuagint, not the Masoretic text. It says thick clouds, uh, a completely different word from Anon or Arafel. This is a third word, thick clouds of the heavens or of the skies. So basically what it seems is that um, Arafel is, are, they're definitely clouds. So the Arafel, the thick clouds are clouds, but not all clouds are are Arafel, not all clouds are thick clouds, kind of like the distinction we make between, you know, all spiritual beings are Elohim, but not uh, Elo there's only not Elohim or Yahweh. So um, two, two really interesting points there. One, that this is Solomon's dad saying this. So he has this understanding between um, the difference between the, the quality and nature of clouds. Um, but then he says that God's making a canopy. And when David says that he's making a canopy that's of thick, dark clouds, he's using the word Sukkot. Now, if you know your Hebrew festivals, you understand that Sukkot is a, it's a booth or a tent. This is the same word that the uh, Septuagint uses for the tabernacle. And so uh, it's not the Hebrew word for, for tabernacle. The Hebrew word is Mishkan. And, uh, but Sukkot specifically conveys this idea of temporary. It's not supposed to be a lasting place to live. Even today, when they celebrate Sukkot, the, temp the, the structures they inhabit intentionally have to have that temporary transient quality to them. They are not supposed to feel too stable or too established because that defeats the purpose. So then, of course, we have within the story of the temple itself, the echoes of uh, Exodus 40. And I'm going to read what it has to say here because you're going to see it immediately. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, and the glory of God filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because of the cloud that settled onto it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all the journeys. So God is <clears throat> no longer going to reside in this tent, but he's now going to live in this exalted house. But at the same time, we're seeing the, 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 the parallel demonstrations of approval. He approved the creation of the tabernacle, and now he's going to approve the, the completion of the temple. But something else is being expressed, and it's this. God still reigns over his people. Because just like they didn't move the tabernacle until the cloud was taken up, it, even though there's not going to be a movement with the temple, God's still going to be the one who determines what happens in this building. Because Solomon might su summon the priest to serve, but God's going to bring a halt to all of that as he manifests himself. He is the one who can compel them to, to leave or to lie down and to give up trying to serve because that's how big he is. God can still override Solomon's um, intent. So um, another linguistic point, I know y'all guys are just loving all of this. Um, <laughs> another linguistic point is he says he builds God an exalted house. Uh, the word exalted here is Zabul. Um, it, it, this is the one that bounced around way too long in my head. Uh, the, the noun only appears five times throughout the Hebrew scriptures. Two of those times are here in 1 Kings, and then again, whenever the, we have the verse repeated in 2 Chronicles. The other three times are Psalms 49-14, uh, Isaiah 63-15, 
and Habakkuk 3.11. Um, there's a couple more times where we find it in its verbal form, but um, it, it still has the same kind of idea. But the BDB uh, translates it as abode or habitation. It's this idea, a location where one resides, basically. And we see that in Habakkuk 3.11. It says the sun and the moon still stood in their place. Zebulah is the, where it is. So place, Zebulah. It, it's uh, not a pronoun or a descriptor. Kind of like, it kind of functions like an adjective in First Kings. Uh, it, that's not how it's functioning here in uh, Habakkuk. It's actually functioning as a noun or the object of a preposition. In Isaiah 63, 15, it says, Look down from the heaven and see your holy, beautiful habitation. Heaven is uh, God's holy, holy habitation. Um, and the, the way it's written there, it's mitzvah. Uh, and it's important because it's found in the exact same um, form in Psalms 49, 14. And it reads, like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. I don't think the ESV does us any favors here. I think they actually, um, they, they discount, they miss the, the mem, which is our prepositional um, prefix there that means from. And so in um, Isaiah, it tells us, it translated, it looked down from your holy, beautiful translation, uh, habitation. Um, here, we lose the from it, it's they translate it as no place and that's it's a bad translation i mean okay let's just be be blunt um i think what the writer here in uh, in psalms is trying to to do is to contrast that these foolish sheep who wind up in sheol they aren't where they were from or they aren't where they're supposed to be they're contrasting this idea so so Zabul isn't like an exalted habitation. It is the habitation. It is the place where God dwells. It, it's not this idea of, oh, let me describe it, uh, describe it, make it prettier. It is actually describing the quality of uh, the dwelling. And so that's where I was really having an issue with what Solomon was saying, because why would he say he's building something that is better than what God created for himself. That, it, it just rubbed me the wrong way. And so um, I think we all know that the temple is supposed to be representative of God's throne room in heaven here on earth. Uh, I think we've brought that up enough times. Should be, should be familiar. It's an accepted premise. It's not even in debate as far as I know. And so when I read this statement by Solomon, or as I read it the first time, it, it just, like Solomon, buddy, you aren't going to build a house for God that's better than what he's got in heaven. And if he wants to manifest as a cloud on earth, yeah, fine. That's great. Um, I, it just seemed like he was taking a little too much credit for himself. But um, DeVries, who um, wrote the word commentary, he actually proposes another solution. And I decided to go ahead and go into all of this because it's a really great time to talk about textual variants. We can talk about how there's different manuscripts that have different things and why that's important. Um, because DeVries says the solution to this issue is actually found in a manuscript of, it's of the Septuagint. It's called the uh, Lucianic Recension. And this, this particular manuscript was not one that's been widely used because it does have some editing. Uh, it's got some additions. Uh, it's got some places where Lucian went in and he attempted to smooth out some problematic eras, er, areas in the text. And for a very long time, it, it was not considered to be reliable because of this. However, it seems like fairly recently there's been a return to look at this manuscript and actually try to understand more of what's going on. And Emmanuel Tove, uh, it, you might know his name if you study the Dead Sea Scrolls, he did a paper talking about the layers 
that they can discern within this manuscript and talked about how a lot of the things they thought were just Lucian's own manufactured readings line up with other Greek text. And it can line up with other um, translations of the Septuagint. It can line up with Josephus. Um, it can line up with um, other popular readings that explain this further. And with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're finding out that there's not as much addition to this text as they previously thought. That these are, he was actually reporting less popular but still valid traditions in how to read the scripture. And so De Vries offers this translation of our verse here in 1 Kings. It says, um, let me see, get up here where I can read. Uh, a son hath Yahweh established in the heavens, as he is proposed to dwell in thick darkness. I have, sh I have surely built a noble house for the residence where thou shalt dwell perpetually. Is it not written in the book of the upright one? Now, so... What this is saying, according to the Lucian re recension, is that Solomon is making a direct quote from the Book of the Upright One. Now, that's the alternative name from the Book of Jasher. And anytime we, we mention the Book of Jasher, we have to make the clarification, you are not going to read the Book of Jasher online or order it from Amazon. We just don't have it. Anything close? Yeah. Anything claiming to be the book of Jasher as of right now, uh, it, it, it's a forgery. It's, it's a fake. And so don't fall for it. it, it it's, you don't need to, to try to look for it. But it was a book that did exist. These other books have just attempted to, to um, trick you. And so um, this Lucian recension uh, manuscript it is telling us where the source of Solomon's quotation is coming from, that he actually is not trying to say something about himself. He's actually singing a psalm, which is, this is what's in the book of Jasher, is a collection of psalms and some other stuff that's going on in there. But it, it contained these songs that didn't make it into our version of the Bible, because there's a lot more psalms written than what we have in our Bible. I mean, this is kind of like people will tell you, you know, um, the hymn book has all the really good Christian music. Well, those are just the hymns that survived. You know, there were some, <laughs> there were some cuts along the way because there's no point in time where everybody who wrote a song wrote a good song that deserved to survive. Um, you know, <laughs> every time. Yeah. It, it, it's just, that's not how it works. And so there's this kind of winnowing process that happens with music. And so we don't have all of the Psalms in our Psalm book. And it seems like the book of Jasher had, has more. And evidently, this was one of the Psalms in that book that Solomon would have known. Uh, the book of Jasher uh, we talked about before is referred to in the Bible. So we do know it exists. And so it seems like the book of Jasher is, um, the Psalm is either referring back to the, the tabernacle, because that's the only house that had been built for God up to this point. Or it was looking ahead to the building of the temple and functioned as a prophetic psalm. Uh, and, you know, that's where I wish we did have a copy so that we could look at it and go, okay, is this speaking about something that happened before or is it looking ahead? We don't know. So why did I get, you know, all kinds of crazy, like, um, crazy rabbit trails and, and geekiness here? When we understand the references that are being put into these statements, and this is a statement that's being made at a very significant moment, it doesn't get much more important than this moment when we're talking about the history of Israel and the history of our faith, really. Uh, I mean, we can look at things like the flood. We can look at things like crossing the Red Sea. We can talk about the establishment of the temple and God's willingness to be present with his people. These are important moments in our faith. And so um, these statements often have these broad sweeping ideas caught up within them where they do reference these points of history to, to show God's greatness. And some of the, the things that Solomon's trying to say here is he, 
he's referencing the song of the sea. So yes, this is God's promise. And only God is the, has the ability to fulfill a promise that he made hundreds of years ago to his people in order to, to fulfill not just the promise there at the, the crossing of the sea where God said, yes, I will establish a house. But that promise goes back to Abraham, which goes back to Eve. And so to see a God who co- coordinates and orchestrates all of history to accomplish his purpose that's huge. This is one reason we need to, to be worshiping him. This is why he deserves this house. This is why we should be working to fulfill this because we get to partner with him in what he's trying to accomplish and will accomplish on this earth, whether we are participate or not. Also, that building this, tab, this temple, it's a declaration of God's victory over the other gods. And yes, the victory is not fully complete at this point. That's not going to happen until future events. But in this time, in this space, in this moment, God reigns and rules in Israel, even more so than Solomon. Solomon is, yes, God's representative in the kingdom. He is God's chosen king. He is God's adopted son. The, all of that is not supposed to point you to the fact that Solomon's the ruler. It's to point you to the fact that God fulfills his promises again. Um, we're, we're going to be told, you know, in this statement, what part of what's trying to be communicated is that God's manifest approval and his authority over the temple is in no way, any shape or form, less than what it was over the tabernacle. And so we have this, this uh, emphasis on both God's transcendence and his nearness. Core issue. I cannot get it. You know, I just, to me, it, it the fact that it's such a core issue within Christianity and Judaism, and that it always has been, that's encouraging to me. And it's, it's amazing to me because it tells me that God is consistent. There is no major change or, you know, some kind of shock or surprise. It's part of the fabric of our faith. And so, uh, you know, if you've ever thought about how far away God is and how distant he is, and then, you know, just to be in awe over the fact he can be present with you in each moment. I, that's, I, I run out of words and I don't have words that go together well, but it, to me, that's just, it, it's amazing. So anyway, but then the other thing is we see how these discussions really were preparation for the coming of Christ and how it still is playing out through history. And when Solomon references this line from his psalm, he points to the temple as a prophetic symbol revealing a heavenly truth. And he's showing us that every element and aspect of the temple is prophetic. And so again, we see this perfect continuity within the scripture from the beginning of the Bible through this point of history, all the way through Revelation. And, you know, Solomon's going to actually bring all this together and he's going to take this quote that he opens the the address with that's almost said as an aside, because we're going to learn as we read further, it seems that he's not even facing the people at this point, that he's kind of saying this as a general observation. And then he turns to address the crowd, and we see him expand all of these ideas that were kind of encapsulated in the single line from a psalm, and and speak them very plainly, very bluntly, very obviously to the people who were there. And, you know, and we still do this today. I mean, you can get a book and a lot of times the book will either open with a line of poetry that has something to do with the themes of the book, or even each chapter has a different quote to, that begins to open up and deal with the themes. We do this. So this is a standard human practice. And that's one of the things that I really appreciate the Bible, about the Bible is how it shows this consistency, not just with God, but all of humanity and how we all wrestle with these same issues and these same questions of faith, it, it's not new. It, it, it's never been new. And we think we're so enlightened and we think we're so smart because look at how deeply we're thinking about this. It, this has always been how humanity has thought about these things. And God has equipped us to ask these questions, but he's also given us these answers and through this progressive revelation that occurs throughout the scripture. And so to me, that's exciting because that's just one more reason to accept the Bible as, as worthy and trustworthy and 
full of integrity for our faith to be founded on. I mean, we don't have to worry about whether or not we're being played or, you know, this is some kind of, you and I were talking about conspiracy theories this morning. You know, there's just no way when you look at how it was woven together, trying to have a conspiracy and all of this, just it, it wouldn't work. You can't get this many writers over this length of time. So, but were you going to say something, Nathan? Nope. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I, I was just uh, making a note here that I was crunching ice near the microphone. Oh. <laughs> and I need to edit that out later. Well, this is why so, you That's all I got. Sorry. Okay. So. Uh... That's, that's my exciting contribution <laughs> to the show. Well, and I think because um, we'll we'll do one more verse right quick, uh, because I'm looking at time here. Uh, it, this kind of illustrates the point that verse 14 says, then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel. We should note that the blessing is not recorded, and that's kind of interesting. We don't know what he said in the actual blessing. Instead, he moves on uh, to some kind of... Um, discussion and and explanation about what's going on with the temple uh anyway the last slide in that verse this is while the assembly of israel well all the assembly of israel stood um this along with the first line of verse 22 suggests that solomon may have been sitting either somewhere in the temple complex um you know inside the doors or in the inner sanctuary um if he's sitting before the altar which is really interesting. This is actually a declaration of who he is. It's saying that he is David's son because only the Davidic kings get to sit before the Ark of the Covenant. That was established in 2 Samuel uh, 7. And I think what we need to remember is Solomon's identity has been a point of question. We've, you know, it's been a while since we read about David and Bathsheba. It's been a while since we read about the fact that Bathsheba was Uriah's wife and that this really put who Solomon's father, uh, who he was into question in the minds of the people. And so, you know, was he Uriah the Hittite's son? Was he really David's son? Was he the legitimate um, heir to the throne? Was he the right son of David to be on the throne? After all, everybody else got killed off. And so Solomon, as we move forward and we don't have time to get into his address, He's going to frame this manifestation of God's approval as not just being approval over the temple itself, but also approval of him as king and him as the legitimate son and heir of David. And so as we move through this, you're going to find there's going to be a lot of references to things like David, my father. He's going to make that point. He's going to drive it home with the people. You can't witness this massive event where God reveals himself so powerfully in the temple I built and doubt that I am my father's son is basically what it's going to come down to. So there's a lot going on here because the political and religious stability of Israel is really going to hinge on who Solomon is. And as long as Solomon remains unified in his purpose to serve God and to reveal God to the nation, the nation will remain unified. It's when Solomon begins to fracture and his beliefs begin to be divided, and his heart is divided, then we wind up with a divided kingdom. And we're going to see how this is going to play out, obviously, as we go forward. But um, I think we're going to leave it there, and we'll look at, look at his, his blessing as a whole next week. And I know we're a little short, but uh, I think we'll be okay. People will forgive us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, I mean, we ran long last week and the week before, I think, so we should be good. <laughs> You know, we'll just like, like daylight savings time, you know, you take it off one end and add it to the other. Yeah, that works for me. You know, well, and I just, for me, this was fun because I got to like be really geeky. I don't know how, you know, how much everybody else is going to enjoy how geeky I got to be with it. But um, I, I do, I do love the minutia and I do love the fact that the, te the textual variants can answer some questions. And I'm glad that we're going back and reevaluating some of those and we're, we're looking at them and that the Dead Sea Scrolls, that those have really opened the door to be able to provide some new insight on things that we thought we knew so well. So, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I do think that there is, a, I think there's some divine timing on a lot of it um, because I do think there are some things that we're finding out, uh, especially in the West, that we were taught that, 
are just completely right. far afield oh, of right. of what the Bible is actually teaching. And um, also, uh, you know, I, I do think there is, um, as we mentioned, is you know, we'll get later into it in the Kings. You know, the, there is a biblical precedence for things that were lost mm-hmm. being uh, explained and re-understood yeah. by a better ancient text. Yeah. Like when they lost the, was it Deuteronomy mm-hmm. they had lost for years? Yeah. And then yeah. we found it and, you know, people want to ask, well, if these are so important for understanding the Bible, why were they lost for so long? Well, probably for preservation's sake, because, uh, you know, if if a lot of these were just sitting around, um, we probably would have just ignored them. But now that they're new, quote unquote, discoveries, they're new to us, um, that would give us a better understanding of the text, then, you know, I think, I think we're kind of in a, a, the church is almost in a crisis mode, to be honest, uh, with, with some of the things we believe. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that God's shedding some light on some things with the, the work of, of good some good archaeology and uh, Are you and saying scholars. God might have perfect timing? Yeah, I mean, he <laughs> seems to seems to work things out that way. Yeah. Anyway, well, that being said, um, everyone, thanks for joining us, and uh, come back next week. Be part of the conversation. In the meantime, Raven Creek SC on all the social media, and Raven Creek SC dot com is the website. Um, go check us out, and uh, and you know, like I said, be part of the conversation. Send us any questions, comments, uh, whatever else you have, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Faith and Other Oddities podcast, a Raven Creek Social Club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.